Right, hello everyone. Welcome to the stream. Yeah, tonight we're talking about the Scientology murders, which are the murders of uh, Doreen Gould and James Sharp, which is a murder often um, uh, associated with the Manson family. And we'll look tonight closer at the details and find out was it really. Uh, but tragically, it is an unsolved murder, so it's still worth looking at anyway, just so the story can be heard. Uh, I've just got this uh, new glass tonight. You can't see the writing on it unless I hold it right up. Look. See the tank array, it says on it. Brand of gin. You've got this little miniature with it. Look how cute that is, the little tiny bottle. And the measure of gin. See, I'm drinking. God, we've got people on the Californian vape. Another guy on the crack, so this could get interesting. Yeah. <laughs> right, so we got 13 people here so far. Welcome if you knew as well. Excuse my cat's foot as well, he's sitting on my lap. There you go. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. And welcome if you're new. I can see I've got new subscribers. I don't stream often enough, I need to stream more. Uh, but like I say, I put so much uh, research into every stream. It's really hard. I, mean, I need to get ahead a couple and then I could do uh, twice a week streams sort of thing. But yeah, this case is interesting because there are police reports available and a couple of photos and things like that, you know, so there's a lot to unpack. So I'm going to get straight into it because I want to. I've got quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. The, yes, my cat did Yeah, smash the moon lamp. Yeah, before I start. So yeah, I'm using the uh, the pumpkin with the uh, colour changing candle behind me. I do like this one. This is one of the new white pumpkins that they brought out. He's out of season, but I still I like I just like pumpkins anyway all year round. Then there's a colour changing LED candle in him. So anyway, to the presentation. The thumbnail there. So, right, yes. Doreen was 18 and she came to Los Angeles from Albany, New York in March 1969 to study Scientology. She lived at 1032 South Bonnie Bray Street at the time of her death, but she had only just moved in there, as we'll find out in a minute. James, aged 15, travelled west from Crestview, a St. Louis, Missouri suburb. James's father was a prosperous salesman and he permitted James to leave high school to study Scientology. He lived at 921 South Bonnie Bray Street. So, yeah, they both lived in the same street, but, yeah, Scientologists tend to do that. They have a lot of things in the same thing. Right. Now, uh, this is uh, the them being seen uh, leaving their homes for the last time. Uh, and this guy's name, I'm going to pronounce it Zach. I don't know how you'd actually pronounce this, but... Uh, Sharp is Zach's roommate. They've lived together since August 1969, when Sharp came from Missouri to attend Scientology classes. Sharp's father is H.C. Sharp, 1437, of Valley Court, Crestwood, Missouri. Sharp and Zach attended classes together on 11, 11 21, 69 at the Church of Scientology. Zach last saw Sharp at 1600 hours at the church. Uh, Zach went to St. Mary's Hospital in Long Beach at 1700 hours to visit Norfolk Jackson. He left the hospital at 2015 hours and went to Webster's Restaurant at Wiltshire Lake, <laughs> Lake Sienga. At 2300 hours, so Zach went to Webb's, Webb Bowles' home at 764 Edgemont, LA. He stayed until 100, 0100 hours and arrived home at 0120 hours, 112269. Sharp had told Zach that he was going to audit a girl by the name of Doreen at the apartment that evening. Zach indicated an auditing session did occur as the apartment, uh, as an e meter and clock were arranged on the desk. Uh, the clock was not plugged in when Zach returned home. It had been moved. It had been moved from its normal location, and the hand had stopped at 7:02. Zach did not know where Doreen lived, but indicated that Danny Wallace might. Right. So that's uh, the last time uh, James Sharp's roommate saw him. Right. And uh, and this is the uh, the oh the manager of uh, Theton Manor. Ouch. The address that Doreen lived at. Sorry, my cat's digging his claws in my knee. Doreen moved in on 11th of the 18th, uh, 11, 18, 69. So only three days before this, before she's murdered, basically. Bear that in mind. 
right? She this is that's as long as she lived at this address, about three or four days before she dies. Uh, she has a boyfriend named Peter Harbour. Doreen left the Thetan Manor at 1845 hours on 11 21 69 with a male Caucasian 20 years named John. Doreen was wearing a white knit wool shawl, a dark blue sleeveless blouse, and an off white Mexican style floor length skirt with multi colour or red three inch wide horizontal stripes approximately one foot from the bottom and no shoes. John returned at approximately 1910 hours and waited for Doreen to return. At 2130 hours, Peter Harbour arrived and stated Doreen was supposed to come to his home at 2100 hours, but didn't show up. Harbour waited with John until 2030 hours in Doreen's room and then left. Investigators checked Doreen Gould's room and found John O'Harris asleep in bed. Harris uh, has known Doreen four days. He confirmed the clothing description given by Ferguson and Thompson. Harris stated he spent the late afternoon with Doreen. At 1850 hours, he walked Doreen to 921 South Bonnie Bray, where he was told she would she was to be audited by a boy named Jim. Jim met Gould and Harris at the entrance to the apartment building. Gould went inside with Jim and Harris, uh, returned to 1032 South Bonnie Bray to visit for Gould. Harris's description of Jim and his clothing matched that of victims James A. Sharp. Right. So basically, she... Uh, uh, the, he was supposed to be auditing her, which is a Scientology thing, isn't it? So they'd gone to audit each other. Or he, he, she, she'd gone to be audited by him. And it looks like they did do that. Uh, but yeah, then they ended up, well, as you, they end up hitchhiking for some reason. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So yeah, did everyone follow that so far? Sorry, it's so boring just to sit and read it out like that. But the yes, the the sentient points to take away are yes, they. Uh, uh, she went round to his flat to be audited and then they go to this place called uh, the org building there's actually a mistake on this slide uh, 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 ignore the top paragraph there that's that was for a different slide right now i'll read this out so they end up at this the uh, org building interview with diane lidgard 925 south at alvadero apartment 3 la lidgard was working as the desk clerk at the la org the evening of 11 21 6. She remembers the victim Sharp and Ghoul signing in at approximately 2015 hours. Victim Ghoul asked if anyone was going to a show. Lidgard saw victims in the lobby after 2045 to 2115 break. Victim was wearing blue pants or dungarees, a light shawl, and a cotton blouse. Victim Sharp was wearing dark pants, a light shirt, and carrying a folder of papers. Right, and then this is an interview with. No, it looks like that's the same person. So he interviewed numerous scientists. Oh, no, yeah, this is uh, the couple interviews numerous Scientologists. Three persons uh, were located and interviewed uh, who saw victims Sharp and Gould the evening of 11 69 Their statements are as follows. Saw Sharp and Gould at the rear of main uh, org building at 2020 hours on 11th of the 21st, 69 11 sorry. Gould asked Perlman if he could examine her and requested to attest to her grade four release. Perlman refused because he was busy. As victim Sharp and Gould walked away, one of them stated, let's walk out to hitchhike to Asho. Perlman does not recall what Gould or Sharp were wearing. Then there's this Bob Mills. So both victims uh, approximately 2105 hours in the publications office. Hill merely said hello and did not talk to Sharp or Gould. Mills described Gould's clothing as blue capris or jeans and a blue sweatshirt. Can't remember the, what victim Sharp was wearing. And then Tanny O'Man saw Sharp and Gould enter the main lobby and sign in at approximately, approximately 1950 hours. O'Nan did not speak to either victims and can't remember what they were wearing. Right, so yeah, I don't know what was going on at this old building either. So then after this, so there's this place, Asho. I don't know what Asho was. And also, I noticed her clothes change as well. When she leaves her apartment, she's wearing a skirt and no shoes. And then when she's at this org building, she's wearing different clothing. And no one mentions that. But several people then see her in this other clothing, these, this blue clothing, blue trousers or dungarees. So that was another weird thing. 
and then we get to their hitchhiking. Right. Investigators and 12 Metro Division officers interviewed residents of, re of reporting district 272. 13 persons reported screams and or disturbances. Uh, oh, wait a second. I jumped ahead of myself. Sorry, yes, I jumped to the wrong slide. Right, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, they're seeing hitchhiking. Interview was Wendy Budnong, 915. So, yeah, that's it's a Scientology student, and it gives her address. Saw victims ghoul and sharp hitchhiking on the northeast corner of 9th and Alvadero. Uh, Alvarado, sorry. Uh, approximately 1915 hours, 112169. Budlong confirmed previous clothing descriptions and added the victim sharp was carrying a white folder. Uh, uh, had long talked to victims ghoul and sharp and they stated that they were going to a show. No victims ghoul could uh, attest to... Uh, her grade four release, which must be a Scientology term. I don't know what that's all about. Her grade four release she wanted. Right, and then Steve Brown, box boy of Von's Market, identified photos of Sharp and Ghoul. Both are occasional customers. Knows Ghoul personally. Saw Ghoul and Sharp hitchhiking on the northeast corner of 9th uh, Alvarado on 11th of the 21st, 69. Uh, 11, 21, 69, sorry. Uh, approximately 19, 45 hours. Bro confirmed previous clothing description, but did not notice Ghoul or Sharp leave the corner or get into a vehicle. So their conclusion is, Ghoul and Sharp were at least seen hitchhiking on the northeast corner, were last seen hitchhiking on the northeast corner of 9th and Alvarado on 11-21-69 at approximately 19.45 hours by two witnesses. At 2300 hours, their bodies were found in the alley at the rear of 11.38 South Magnolia. Evidence at the scene indicated the bodies had been dumped in the alley due to the large number of stab wounds each victim sustained and the quantity of blood at the scene. Investigators are of the opinion that the murders occurred in the immediate area and the, uh, that the bodies were found. Right. So, yeah, they're sort of, they're picked up hitchhiking and then their bodies are dumped, uh, just dumped in the uh, alley behind a house, basically. Well, it's like behind a business, I think. Hello everyone, yes, thank you. Oh, we've got 20 people watching now. Hello. Okay, we'll see. What is that? The backgrounds on the font. <laughs> right, yeah, so this is it. And uh, like reading more about this case as well, the girl uh, had become disillusioned with Scientology. So it looks like both of them had maybe planned to run away together and she wasn't really being audited. And yeah, I should have looked into what the grade four release is all about. Is that about trying to leave Scientology, maybe? Was she trying to leave? And uh, her father said that he'd had conversations with her where she said that she'd, she'd become disillusioned with Scientology and she might leave it. So it looks like maybe the kids were just leaving Scientology together. And they get funny about that, don't they? Scientologists don't like it when people leave. All right. So then the screams are heard. Investigators at, tw at 12 Metro Division officers interviewed residents of reporting district 272. 13 persons reported screams and or disturbances the night of 11 21 69. 11 of these reports were eliminated as not related to the murder by subsequent investigation. Two possibly related reports are as follows. Uh, Mabel Lamar heard adult female voice scream for help three or four times 11 21 69 at 22 30 hours. The voice was distressed and came from northeast of the 1248 South Eldon, apartment 6. Edna Pappas heard adult female voice scream for help four or five times during the late evening hours, 11.21.69. Voice came from the north and west of 12 of 1200 1, South Magnolia Street. Right. Yeah. Well, that is a good question, isn't it? Yeah, because she appears to have changed her clothes as well. So it does, it does make you wonder if they were planning to run off together. But the, here it gets to their autopsies. It gets a bit interesting here, right? Autopsies were performed by Dr. Gaston Herrera. Findings were as follows. Victim Doreen Gould sustained 35 stab wounds to the chest, 6 stab wounds to the neck, and 9 stab wounds to the top of the head. 
stab wounds were inflicted with uh, a half to one inch wide knives with blades to up to four inches in length, having one sharp and one dull edge, depressed open fractures to right face and nose, inflicted by whipping with a pattern device, probably after death. Death attributed to multiple stab wounds to the chest, perforating the heart seven times, aorta once, right lung six times and left lung 17 times, spermatozoid in vaginal vault. And victims James A. Sharp sustained 15 stab wounds to the chest, three stab wounds to the right, eight stab wounds to the back of the head, one stab wound to the back of the neck, one stab wound to the back of the right arm, 16 stab wounds to the back, and three defence wounds to the left hand. Stab wounds were inflicted with a half to one inch wide knives, approximately four inches in length, having one sharp and one dull edge. Two depressed wounds to the left of the forehead, one inflicted by whipping with a pattern device. Death attributed to multiple stab wounds to the chest and back, perforating the heart three times, the left lung eight times and the right lung eight, eight times. Uh, but the thing is as well, there's the other um, accounts, other accounts of their um, autopsies and everything. Well, uh, accounts of their death talk about uh, their eyes being cut out. So I'm going to uh, try and get to that now. I'm not going to read all of this. I just want to read his account of... Uh... Someone stabbed Doreen and James between 15 and 60 times each. 17 of the stab wounds inflicted on Doreen were near her heart. She was raped. Their right eyes were cut out. The overkill recalled the brutality of the Tate LaBianca murders in August, but police uncovered no link between Doreen James and the other victims. Following the autopsy, the coroner concluded Doreen was a recent arrival to Los Angeles because her lungs were smog free. The coroner was right. Doreen came to Los Angeles from Albany, New York, a few months earlier to study Scientology. James was also a recent arrival to Los Angeles. He travelled west from Crestview, a St. Louis, Missouri suburb. He came to study Scientology too. In fact, their study of Scientology was the only thing linking them. But yes, this thing that their um, uh, eyes were cut out, uh, that, that's not mentioned in their autopsies, but no wounds to their faces are mentioned. But there is, uh, you can find um, links to photos of them. Uh, I don't recommend it if you're squeamish, but uh, yeah, there is definitely some wounds to their face, but it's, I don't know if their eye was cut out. But both of them definitely, there was wounds to their faces and they had their right eyes really cut. At least, or no, they've been stabbed in the eyes. Well, the picture of James Sharp, it's very far away from him. You only get a close-up of Doreen's face. But you can see there's something up with his right eye. And that sort of evolved into their eyes were cut out. But yeah, they definitely their eyes were slashed up. And uh, let's see. I guess I think it's this one. You see, that's the imprint of the chain there. You see that? And that middle picture there, that's where Doreen's body was found. You can see the outline of her body there. And uh, yeah, that's the alleyway. And you can see the garages at the end of the alleyway. That's where their bodies were found. But that's the imprint of the chain on the ground. So it's like they, they dropped their bodies there and then whipped them with these chains. And I thought that makes it sound like it's bikers. <laughs> that was my immediate thought. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. And the timing's out as well. And uh, like I say, I, I did never really managed to find out what this org building was and what was happening there. And they were they signed into it because she was audited at his house. So why did she have to? Why were they at this org building? Is that uh, was there an event going on there or something? I don't know. It's very odd. Yeah, these are the only photos I can show you because it doesn't have the bodies in them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's the imprint of the chain. Yeah, that's that's um, where she was dumped. And you can see the outline of her body. She was left and she was naked as well. Her body was left naked. Uh, but James Sharp wasn't. James Sharp still had his clothes on. Yeah, and that's like, like I say, and they, uh, in the police report as well, they could never find, they never managed to find the chain that made that pattern. As well, they tried to find out where the chain was from, but they couldn't find it. Like I say, yeah, that's the alleyway on the end. 
in the garages at the end of where the bodies were dumped. But they, the police thought that they weren't killed there, they'd been killed somewhere else and then their bodies were dumped there. Hmm. Yeah, there's no evidence for that though. That's what we're going to get to, Delinda. In the end, it's, it just is. It doesn't seem very likely that she ever did date Bruce. She wasn't a, around him enough. She only lived in that house. It's just a coincidence that they both shared that address. They didn't live there at the same time or anything like that. And at the time this happened, Bruce would have been running from zero, uh, the because he was there when zero died. That wasn't he. Mm. Hello, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. The police said that it was a small amount of blood, but I think that looks like quite a lot of blood. But she was, yeah, definitely nearly dead. Cool, yeah, because, uh, like I say, I mean, obviously I don't show the pictures of the body style, but you see, yeah, she was stabbed a lot, and I read out the amount of stab wound she had. Quite really brutally stabbed. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get to it because there's like there's no real source for all this as well. It's just sort of something that um people have said, you know, and it's not backed up by anything. Oh god, yes, and this is the other the weird stuff that comes up in the police report. Uh she um Uh, yes, that she uh, she had no arrest record with LAPD or C two on Ghoul or Sharp. Rampant records revealed an FI card written on Sharp 11.13.69 at 9th in Alvarado, curfew suspect, loitering, questioned and released. Hollywood records revealed an FI card was written on Ghoul 9.10.69 at Mount Hollywood Drive and Vista Del, Del Val. <laughs> at that time, Ghoul claimed to have been raped by two male Negroes who picked her up while hitchhiking. Ghoul refused to make a crime report or give further information. Officers noted that she appeared high and had needle marks on her arms, questioned and released. And then there's, yeah, this weird guy, John Oran, the report of this, listen to this. Found John Oran, Harris, male Caucasian, date of birth 829-49, attending classes at the org, transported Harris to Rampart Station where he was identified by Mrs. K and interviewed. Harris was carrying a straight razor in his shorts. Harris stated he met Russell Handy, Scientologist, at De Denny's Restaurant, on 11 69 and he took Harris into his confidence and told him that Doreen and Jim's spirits came to him and told him that two male Negroes picked them up while they were hitchhiking and killed them. Harris added that Handy told him that he was the license, that he has the license number of the vehicle uh, the suspects used. Investigators checked the current crime reports and found that Harris fit the description of a 217 PC suspect that slashed the victim's neck the straight razor on 11th of the 5th 65 uh, Harris was subsequently booked 217pc at central jail so yeah so this guy uh, they picked him up because he'd been going around saying he knew who did it and he said that yeah spirits had told him and I wonder if um, they had perhaps she had told other people about this being raped by two negroes and that's where they where they're getting that from and uh, yeah, but they said that uh, spirits told them that. So yeah, very strange. But when they hauled in the guy to question him about that, they search him and find he's got a straight razor, and he's a suspect in slashing someone with the neck, slashing someone's neck. But later in the police report, they let him go because the guy refuses to identify him. Once they've got him, the guy has been slashed. So that's just another weird one. Hmm. Oh, what is he? Paul Wood was charged with manslaughter over that, uh, the shooting of that woman, yeah. Yeah, because he had no reason to even be pulling the trigger in that scene as well, did he? <laughs> but anyway, what should I take video? Same two guys from the Sharon Tate video. Oh, God, yeah, oh, the black guys, yeah. I see what you mean. Right, oh, yes, and this guy, Russell Hands, is the source of the spirit dream. This is the medium. Look. And he admits making the statements regarding Sharp and Ghoul's ass assailants to John Harris. 
and he states he was at home sleeping the afternoon of 11 24 69 when Jim and Doreen's spirits contacted him in a dream. Jim and Doreen's spirits told him that there was evidence in a trash can. Andy states he saw the angry face of a male Negro suspect. Andy claims to be a psychic and believes that all persons have lived uh, prior. Also had a dream that this person told him that the licence number of the vehicle that picked up Jim and Doreen was either WTL690 or WTZ690. And he reluctantly identified this psychic Scientologist as Cheryl Curlum, female Caucasian, 20, who was employed at the South Bay Scientology Organization. And he agreed to a polygraph examination. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, several people who were psychics had spirit dreams about this case and said it was two black guys. But yeah, I wonder if yeah, they've just they heard about the incident that she reported, uh, that she said where she said she had been attacked by two black guys who had uh, she who picked her up hitchhiking. And yeah, this so this guy is the source of that. Oh yes, and this is the only woman that interviews uh, bikers. Yeah, that uh, talks about uh, bikers. Interview with Leslie Ann Buffard. 8901 Laurel Canyon, Van Nuys. Uh, Buffard is an ex-process member who was active in the San Jose chapter from May 1967 to October 1969. The process was founded in 1962 by Robert Grimstone, who after a falling out with L. Ron Hubbard, left the Church of Scientology and formed a militant group. During Buffard's tenure and in the process, she witnessed two probable murders and as knowledge of uh, other crimes, the process and motorcycle gangs in the San Francisco Bay Area are involved. Investigators from San Francisco Police Department, San Jose Police Department, Santa Barbara County Sheriff and Napa County District Attorney's Office have been notified. And there's a tape number available at Rampart Detectives. So, yeah. So this woman connects it to the process judge and she says she she witnessed murders two murders when she was with the process judge which is another one Ooh. yeah make us all like would rather use a bowie knife than a straight razor so yeah but it's, that's harder to conceal in your jacket isn't it well that, that, that guy was wearing shorts he had the straight razor in his shorts you can conceal a bloody Bowie knife in your shorts, could you? <laughs> but yeah, I thought that's interesting because it at least connects it to bikers because it, it was assumed it was a bike chain that their bodies were whipped with. And they've been whipped across the face with these chains. God, this is really nice. Yeah, for people, look, this is my new Tanqueray gin glass I got. Can you see the writing on it? It doesn't show up, I don't think. It says Tanqueray on it. Yeah, for people that didn't see it. Yeah. Oh, yes, you can see it. Look. Yeah, it says Tanqueray on it. And the little miniature bottle of gin. Look how cute that is. It's tiny. <laughs> Going down too well. Yes. Cheers. Is anyone else drinking? Everyone was just, yeah, doing edibles and smoking earlier. And there was one guy on crack. He's gone quiet. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It is nice. We're just going to take a break from reading. How long have we been going? 34 minutes. Oh, that's all right. Wasn't he said? <laughs> What's the next slide? Oh, it's a pretty one. We'll go up to that one. Smoking and coughing, yeah. I've not been coughing, luckily. <laughs> Mick cat's drinking, someone's drinking. And Lisa's about to grab a drink. Excellent. Right. Oh, yes, and this is the only uh, time they investigated the family, but it's unclear who it is they spoke to. Yeah, so, yeah, listen to this. James Kennedy and Anthony M. Schultz, representatives of the National Features Syndicate, 
5525 uh, Wilshire Boulevard. Schultz and Kennedy have conducted an extensive investigation in the Los Angeles and Bishop areas into the Tate LaBianca murders. They feel that Scientology and the process are one of the one and the same organization, and that there is a possible link between the Sharp and Ghoul murders and the Tate LaBianca murders. During their investigation, they interviewed several nomads in the Bishop area, some of which claim to be Scientologists. The family, uh, a group of hippies, reside here. None of the family are Scientologists or Mexicans. None of the family members know victim Sharp or Ghoul. Investigators searched the home and failed to find any evidence of the crime scene. Yes, and the relevance of the Mexicans thing is as well, um, they found hair in James Sharp's hand and they said it matched either Indian or Mexican. Uh, and they hair and they think by Indian they meant Native American sadly in the 60s they called them Indians didn't they yeah I wondered that but no I couldn't find any any slaves or straits connections that I found but none no and no evidence that she ever really met Bruce Davis even or anything like that so I, I don't know where people are getting that from that's the thing right uh, and that's it. That's what I've got. But yes, there was this blog uh, that sums it up really well, basically. Green Grass and Rainbows, the murder of Doreen Gould, that's a quote from my father. Look, that's the house, the childhood home of Doreen Gould. And that's the... And that, that, there's some other photos of her, some photos of her I hadn't seen before. Right. It's on the bit that I want to read. Right. Uh, police reports indicate that Bruce Davis of the Manson family lived in the same Scientology boarding house as Ghoul in LA at 1032 South Bonnie Bray Boulevard and suggested he had dated her, though Davis denied even knowing her. Granted, not a great source, but I'm not sure when Davis would have even found the time. Ghoul had only moved into the South Bonnie Bray location dubbed Theton Manor by Scientologists on November the 18th, 1969, just four days before her murder. She previously lived at the Navarro Apartments, 915 South Averado, which was not linked to Scientology. According to the police report, which also noted Gould had a boyfriend named Peter Harbour at the time, he was investigated and cleared of the crime. Notably, Davis was on the run after the alleged suicide of John Philip Hort, uh, a.k.a. Zero, uh, November the 5th, 1969, during which he was present and unlikely to return to where he could be recognised and reported to the police. And there's another picture of the alley from Google Maps that Davis worked at Scientology headquarters in London from November 1968 to April 1969 when he was fired for his drug use and returned back to the United States. Nevertheless, they continued to allow him to live in the organization's housing. It was a busy time for the Manson family with multiple murders taking place. And despite his brief residency at a Scientology owned building, Davis generally moved around with them. He applied for a driver's license on June the 30th, 1969, under the name Jack Paul McMillan, using the Spam Ranch as the address, where he was involved in the murder of ranch hand Shorty Shea on August 26th, 1969, after which he went to the Barker Ranch in Death Valley with other Manson family members until October the 12th, 1969, when they were arrested during a police raid. As previously stated, Davis went on the run after Halt's death uh, on November the 5th, 1969. Davis's whereabouts on the night of the murders of Gould and Sharp on November 22nd, 1969 are unknown. However, Ed Sanders, author of the excellent Manson Family Chronicle, The Family, reports Davis was back in England by November 23rd, 1969. And an Interpol report dated May 23rd, 1970, says London re police reported Davis had returned more recently, though the date of arrival is not reported. If true, this means Davis may not may have been out of the country at the time of the murders uh, that were taking place. Granted, however, as noted above, Davis's whereabouts that evening remain unconfirmed. If Davis had met Gould, it would have been in June 1969 after her arrival and before the family moved to Barker Ranch. However, while possible, the odds are unlikely Gould was uh, Gould was not living in Theton Manor at the time. Further, given Davis's activities in July and August. An opportunity for contact between the two seems further unlikely. The only other opportunity Davis would have had to have dated her would have been between mid-October and early November, after the Barker Ranch raid. 
during which he was in prison for a short time and before the death of Hout. Consequently, while many cons conspiratorial reports have Bruce Davis living in the same Scientology residence as Gaul on the South Bonnie Bray Boulevard, it was likely not during that time she lived there. November 18th to November the 21st, 1969. While remotely possible, a casual hookup between typical of the free love era, there is no evidence of a, relation, of a relationship between Davis and Gaul. It is all speculation based upon coincidence. Speaking of coincidence, my research also identified a Bruce Davis who lives at Bonnie Bray Lane in Colorado Springs, CO, at the time of this writing. Weird, huh? So, yeah. Basically, yeah, he summed it up pretty well. Hi, Robin. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've read through most of it. Yeah, but that's it, basically. And it's fucking, he was possibly not even in the country as well. And yeah, if you look at my channel, this we went to the house that he stayed at while he was in England, uh, the Bruce Davis Scientology Cottage video expedition. Uh, I went there with Nicholas Shrek. That was the house he stayed at uh, when he came to the UK. And yeah, that's another thing that, that uh, I thought of as well, because he's supposed to have returned to the UK again. So he might not have even been in the country when this happened. And the address that they shared, she only lived at for three days before she died. And uh, like, there's just when, yeah, when did he have the chance to have a relationship with her? If you think about it, all the stuff he was involved in, <laughs> when did he have a chance? And also, uh, there's uh, in the description, uh, you'll find the Manson family, uh, the Manson blog post where you can look at the crime scene photos as well. Uh, but if you look at it, it just doesn't look to me the same as the Manson family. It's not the Manson family's MO sort of thing as well. They break into people's houses and kill them in their houses and leave them there, don't they? These people were killed somewhere else, then dumped. It just doesn't look like a Manson family crime at all to me. And definitely not the sort of thing Bruce Davis did. Yeah. Well, no one knows, doing that. No one knows who actually killed them. It's an unsolved case, don't, don't they? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they kept, yeah, because it said they had sperm, but I don't know if they would have kept it. How would they have kept it from those days, isn't it? It's an unsolved case. No one knows who actually killed them. <laughs> and Nicholas Shrek ain't really interested in all the stuff like this. His book ain't really even a true crime book. It's more of a book about Charles Manson than crime. <laughs> I know, I just really don't see how it could have been Bruce. And Tex was back in Texas by this time. So, yeah, it can't have been him either. And it just doesn't look like a Manson family murder to me. I mean, yes, they were stabbed a lot, brutally stabbed, and that is horrible, and that is similar. But I really don't think that it looks like a Manson family crime. And it's terrible that whoever did this got away with it. There was a letter. I didn't include it. Uh, I could look it up. Because, yeah, we've only been going 44 minutes. But they, they, they claimed uh, they found a letter in our room. Uh, from the yeah, that's it. A lot of people say it if you get around on the internet, it doesn't look like it really was, you know, it's just speculation, but it's worth covering because it's horrible and it was never solved, you know, and that's just tragic, but yeah. But I thought as well, it looked personal. A lot of people say it, it was there was some kind of message to it. I don't know if it was necessarily ritualistic, but both of them had something done to their right eye, whether their right eye was fully cut out. You know, who knows? Uh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't enough of a forensic expert to analyse that. And like I say, the photo that you see of James, it's from quite far away. So you can't really see. But yeah, um, but they were, yeah, definitely brutally stabbed and then hit with a bike chain after they uh, died, Yeah, which made me think, you know, it just seems, which immediately made me think of bikers. And there was that one woman who spoke about the process church. And uh, she spoke about bike gangs being involved. But that's it. Yeah, that's it. Lots of people stabbing. It's uh, the same knife used on both of them, it sounds like. They describe it. Yeah. That's what I wonder as well. Did they witness it? Was it mistaken identity? Did people think they were someone else maybe? Or yeah, they had witnessed something and that's why they were trying to run away. Yeah, they had seen something they were not supposed to. And that's why they were trying to get out. 
of the city, maybe, <laughs> but someone caught them before they could. Because it's weird she changes her clothes as well, doesn't it? It suggests that she was... But apparently Scientologists are weird about people trying to leave, aren't they? So she could have just done that because she thought they wouldn't let her leave. Uh, but yeah, they're really anxious. They they put up loads of money. They put up a $30,000 reward for evidence that would clear the uh, the organisation of involvement in it. Because they were, you know, it was such a bad publicity for them, these murders. Because it obviously looked really bad for them. But yeah, it's a horrible, horrible thing though. That's so it with text, wasn't it? Gary's house, was he? Uh, so yeah, uh, Annie wasn't at Bernard Crow, but Bernard Crow was different as well. Bernard Crow, there was no stabbing of Bernard Crow, was there? It was all just shooting, but he wasn't at Gary Hinman's, was he? But that was stabbing in the chest, yeah, which is what killed most of the victims. But yeah, Tex wasn't at that one, was he? <clears throat> cool, that's nice. Oh, sorry, that rattled the mic. Oh, God. Got another cigarette and camera. Yeah, but... I'd say I feel sorry... Well, I don't really feel sorry for Bruce as such, but I think he gets a lot of bullshit pinned to him <laughs> when, uh, actually, if you analyse him, he actually was probably one of the least violent of the lot of them. Hmm. Yeah. This is it. They were an offshoot, weren't they? Yeah. The the, the guy left the process church. Uh, the guy left the Scientology, and uh, started his own church. Yeah. But the process were more radical. Yeah. And they said radical things. <laughs> Maybe they were trying to defect to the process church. I don't know. Yeah. I there, there's nothing about that. There was a evidence. She was a Catholic. Doreen apparently was a Catholic and she was just going to return to Catholicism. Hmm. Well, any biker who did this would have to be thinking, but it could be a hit, couldn't it, of some sort or whatever, or some kind of weird initiation into a gang. Yeah, it was another thing that's in the police report. So I didn't have time to bloody screenshot everything and show everything. But in the police report, they talk about there being two street gangs in the area as well that they investigated. Obviously found no links, so there was a lot of gangs in the area. So it could have been something to do with that. But bloody hell, is a gang initiation that extreme that they'd expect you to do that to someone? I don't know. But yeah, you can see why they linked it to the Manson family, because it was so violent. But I wonder if it was like, no, a copycat as such, but you know, people trying to compete. But yeah, it's the motorcycle chain, the whipping with the motorcycle chain that yeah sort of haunts me about this one. Makes me think, yeah, that, that must mean something. It's just horrible that it was never solved as well. They never found who did it. And I wish it was as simple as it was Bruce and Tex or something like that, but I don't think it was. And it yeah, it has to have been more than one person as well, apparently. <laughs> the police thought it couldn't have just been one person on their own. They must have had help. And there's just there's not enough to back up that he actually knew her. It's just a coincidence that they lived they had the same address at one point, but she was only at that address for four days before she died. Or before she appears to have been trying to run away. For whatever reason. And again, yeah, I wanted to know what Asho was. <laughs> I don't know if you pronounce that A show or Asho. When they're at that org building, they were asking if anyone was going to it, and then yeah, and they, then she left saying, "Let's hitchhike." So this Asho, whatever it was, I don't know what the hell was that? Yeah. But obviously, they were trying to get away, weren't they, from something? There's just so much that you will never bloody know about these things. But yeah, I think it's unlikely it was Bruce Davis. In <laughs> in conclusion. Yeah. No, that's pretty much all I had for this. So what else? Oh yeah, that's it. Was it fucking Reeve Whitson? Of course it was. Reeve Whitson in Karate Dave. At 4am. <laughs> 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 I 
Sorry, no, that's a, that's a really, really old joke. Back from my old, uh, my old, old school Manson groups. Yeah, we used to fucking joke about that. Reeve Whitson being the one behind everything. Everything that can't be explained was fucking Reeve Whitson. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Mm. No, I never believed it. I never believed that she didn't die. I could believe that maybe she wasn't pregnant, but not that she didn't die. I never believed she didn't die. But now I think she was. <laughs> It's just fucking weird that it's not mentioned in her autopsy report. That's the weird thing. And you can find her autopsy report and read it. It is not mentioned anywhere that she was pregnant. That's just fucking bizarre. Yeah, everyone was. <laughs> Under the influence of amphetamines. And bikers notoriously liked doing amphetamines, didn't they? Yeah. The overkill stabbing may have indicated the killers were under the influence of amphetamines. And also, yeah, well, a lot of them, but it sounds like the same knife, or at least the same type of knife. Because, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stab wounds. The guy was stabbed in the back a lot. And there were fibres found on them as well, uh, from insulation. Yeah, that's the thing. I wonder if there, that's, I wonder if that's why it's not mentioned, because there would have been a second autopsy for the baby. I need to find a forensic expert to find out what would happen in this case. Yeah, what do they do if a pregnant woman dies? Is that why? And was there a sec second autopsy on the baby that we haven't seen? Who knows? Because that is one possible explanation as to why it doesn't say anything about the fact she's pregnant. Hmm. <sighs> what? I think Linda Ronstadt is the Zodiac. Fucking hell. <laughs> yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she definitely does, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they said the baby would have survived as well, didn't they? Yeah. But it's unfortunate. It is terrible. Yeah, they, and they never stabbed her in the stomach as well, yeah. Like the people say. They didn't. Yeah, it does sound like a buck knife, doesn't it? But is that what they actually used when they was killing? Because they didn't have they they didn't use ones with a flat blade, uh, with a flat edge, in the because uh, that's well, that's not what it, what it says in the autopsy reports for the CLA drive murders. And the knives they used on the lobby anchors appear to be knives they got from their kitchen. They actually used their own kitchen knives on them. They didn't use knives they bought with them, which is weird. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I might as well end this now and go to an after stream because yeah, I've run out of stuff to read out, and that was that's pretty much what I have. And like I say, in the description, you can find the Manson blog article, which has the PDF of the whole police file. If you want to read more, it is interesting. It goes into a lot about Scientology as well. That's it. Oh, good luck with that. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so yeah, uh, I'll end this now and go to an after stream. And, uh, yeah, well, you can uh, look at the police reports and all that and the photos if you want to see the photos of their injuries uh, then you can find them linked from the Manson blog post that is in the description again they're not just in the post you have to click a link to see them but all that's available so look at that if you're interested yeah I'll see you in a bit everyone I say yeah like and subscribe if you haven't already and thanks for watching and uh, like I said I've done a whole series of videos on the Charles Manson case 
because uh, it's uh, interesting. The other crimes they committed, uh, apart from CLO Drive. To understand why CLO Drive happened, there's a lot you have to understand. So check out my other videos if you haven't already. Excellent. Right. Thanks for coming anyway, guys. And I'll be back in about five minutes.